I would say the most common time frame of big people having back pain is 40 to 80. So as people get older, degeneration happens and they get more back pain. Causes are certainly different. As we get older, more people certainly do get more back pain. This is the Man Up Podcast, a doctor's guide to men's health. Each week on our podcast, we interview the top specialists of the field on various topics in men's health. If you have questions that you are too afraid to ask, we have the answers. This week, our episode is titled, Baby Got Back Pain. I'm Dr. Kevin Chu, and I'm joined as always with my co-host, Dr. Justin Dubin. Justin, I saw you just had some stone crabs. They look fucking delicious. Oh, baby. It is officially stone crab <laughs> season. October 15th marks the start of stone crab so I went mm, went with my mm, grandpa mm. and a couple of the the elderly Jewish Boca people, and we um, had a great time at Billy's Stone Crab. Shout out Billy Stone Crab! You know I don't feel I've I don't want that. Oh, it's so good! So they do all you can eat. Stone Where crab. is it? It's in Hollywood, Florida. It's in Hollywood, Florida. Okay, okay. Um, they do all you can eat if you want to. I didn't do all you can eat. My grandfather did all you can eat. Like the guy can just house house stone crabs. But, so, so give me a number. All you can eat. Like, how many are you? How many are you eating? You know, True Luck was another place they used to do all you can eat on Mondays. Um, the, the, right, the one right. there was one in Boca. There's one in Brickell still that's there. Um, I had not done it at Brickell, but when I would go with my grandfather at All You Can Eat, you know, a couple of years ago, we were taken down. The guy was taking down forty stone claws, like medium claws. Forty. Forty crazy the guy just inhales them i would get to like 25 and i'd tap out but you Dude, know 25 is good though 25 is good i remember just going to joe's and i'd get like the you know medium get like six or eight of them and i'd be like i'm oh, pretty good oh yeah i had you six know. today and i was good and i was good but he ate about 15 today so you know and he was just like, I just want to be comfortable. I don't want to really be nauseous. I was like, Jesus Christ, man. But yeah, stone crab season is back. <laughs> I love that. I love that sentiment. You know, it's like, I just want to feel comfortable yeah. today, So I'm not going to go too crazy. <laughs> yeah. Billy's is great. That's it's, awesome. It's great. I love stone crab. It's probably my favorite food. Me and Tom, who's been on the show, we're going to start crabbing again. We do stone crabbing. It's sustainable, mm. which is really cool. Um, so this Sunday, we're getting the traps out. Follow me on Instagram. And so you guys are just it. putting the traps out. You guys are just putting the traps out, and then you guys will go pick it up, uh, you know, in one week or two weeks. No, right? just like you can do like three days, but usually we do it once a week. You know, you put in the bait. Usually we use pig's feet and uh, a can of cat cat food. You you poke it so it chums. Interesting. And then, you know, you uh -huh. drop it in an area. You leave it. You have your little buoy marker, and then you bring it. You, you go pick it up in a couple days. And then, you know, you stab it in the elbow. They have an elbow and you stab it and they have a release mechanism, a defense mechanism that the crab releases its claw. You throw the, the crab back, it lives, and then you eat the claws. And it's a beautiful thing. You know, that's probably only something you get away with doing in Miami. I feel like if you left a buoy with, a, you know, something that's marking where you were crabbing, here in LA, if they had crabs out here, man, that should be stolen. I, you know, <laughs> you know so you're right. And I'm shocked that we don't get poached all the time. But I, I think the thing is like, we're in an area, you can't just take a jet ski for the most part and just go grab okay. it. And like, if you see this, you have right. to pull it up. You know, you can't just do that. You need like an actual boat. And if you have a boat, gotcha. you're just a dick. If you're just going around stealing crap, like, <laughs> This isn't like Cosmo That's Kramer true. and Seinfeld just pulling up the lobster traps or anything. <laughs> yeah. Like, you know, you have to be on a boat to do this. Like, you can't just go around and right, do it. Right. Gotcha. Gotcha. Well, hey, that sounds like fun, man. It is great. Um, and uh, weather's probably pristine right oh, now in Miami. Unbelievable. It's actually cold. I got cold. So that that's how good it is right now. Yeah. What it was. Uh, but yeah, no, I'm excited to come see you in LA. So I'm pumped for that, even though you're yes. not gonna be there. Where are you gonna be? Hey, 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 hey. Well we 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 will spend a good, good six days together, but I will miss the first part of the weekend uh when I'm out golfing. Oh, but you know. Sounds terrible. You know. Yeah, sounds terrible. That'll be fun. Sounds That'll terrible. be fun. But yeah, let's get into this episode. So what are we talking about today, Kev? 
So uh, in this episode today, we're actually talking about something that, you know, a portion of guys are going to go through and a lot of guys will go through by, you know, as they, as they get older, and that's back pain, all right? And we're going to talk about how common back pain is, you know, what age should we expect it, and what are the common causes? And these are questions that I think a lot of dudes have, right, Justin? Oh, yeah. I mean, I think we've all had back pain at some point. I think it's one of the most common things that people all have. Um, you know, thank God we don't manage back pain. That's something I never want to manage. And I think Kevin agrees. The only kind of back pain we see is kidney stones, but that doesn't even, and that can be confused with back pain. And we've both seen that, but, uh, in general, I'm very happy. It's a little easier to treat though. You know, we can put up a stent and, you know, kind of help that back pain go away. Correct. Some of this other chronic back pain, much, much more difficult to take care of. Yeah. And I think one of the things that, you know, we realize is there's ways to prevent back pain. There's things you can do, but I feel like a lot of guys, especially guys, a lot of people, especially guys are just like, Oh yeah, back hurts. I'm good. Just never go to the doctor. And, and, uh, I mean, I've been guilty of that too. Well, I mean, you know, for sure. Absolutely. And just when you have that pain and you just kind of let it go and just be like, yeah, yeah, I'll just let it go. Not really kind of treat it or go take a look, uh, take a look at it. Those things can kind of linger. And, you know, we have analogous things in urology, but back pain can lead to much, much more bigger problems if you don't take care of it early on. And so in this episode, we really go over why you should get yourself in front of a specialist to kind of discuss back pain and what, you know, trying to identify the root cause for it and things you can do. Yeah. And, and talking about specialists, we, we have a really a good friend of yours, uh, Dr. Krishna yes. Shah. Um, uh, Dr. Shaw, he's an anesthesiologist and interventional pain, uh, doctor who is at Baylor college of medicine, a very prestigious place, um, and a good friend of Kevin. So it was very cool to, uh, have him on. And we definitely learned a lot from him. He's, he's very, very knowledgeable in the space. He's been dealing with a lot of patients who have back pain. So make sure to check him out if you're in the, uh, Texas area. Um, any other comments or concerns, Kev, before we get into this? Uh, no, I, this was a fantastic episode. We learned a lot. And more importantly, just kind of are focusing on an area where I, th- I think it's very important for guys to not put in the, you know, kind of just be like, hey, just put it to the side and, you know, we'll take care of it in a few years kind of thing. No, and uh, we'll, we'll learn a lot in this episode. And, um, yeah, I think we should jump into it. Let's do it. As always, uh, questions, comments, concerns, we do have an email, themanuppod at gmail.com. Feel free to reach out there. Um, you can also uh, follow us on all our socials at the Man Up Pod on TikTok, Instagram, and Twitter X. Uh, follow us on YouTube. Subscribe that we got these new cameras. I think they look pretty damn good. So you can look Dude, at our Justin, beautiful you look faces. Beautiful in you high really def, look high def much def. better than me. But uh, <laughs> um, and then of course, download, subscribe, give us a review of five stars on iTunes, Spotify, Amazon. Always appreciated. But having said that, let's get on with the show. As men's health specialists, we know guys are shaving their balls. Yeah, we examine a lot of you, so we literally see it, but we also have the data showing it, too. That's right. According to research, over 85% of men trim their pubes. Not only that, but research shows that over 70% of women prefer a partner with at least partially trimmed pubic hair. So, guys... We know you're trimming the hedges, and we know that most women prefer you manscape. So if you're going to shave your balls, why not use the best men's grooming kit around? We're talking about Manscaped. With the Manscaped Performance Package 4.0, you get the Lawn Mower 4.0 with their all-new skin-safe electric trimmer that protects your balls from getting those cuts we've all had in the past. You also get the Weed Whacker 2.0 for trimming your nose and ear hairs. And let me tell you guys, we all need to do a better job of this. Yep, that's right. Kevin and I both have the performance package, and we really love it. Manscaping has never been easier for us. And for our listeners, we have a special promotion. Go to manscaped.com and enter promo code MANUP and get 20% off your first purchase. Go get your Manscaped products today. Your balls and your partner will thank you. All right, so we are joined here uh, by Dr. Shaw. And uh, let's just jump into the question. So, Dr. Shaw, first question. How common is back pain amongst men? Is it more or less common in men or in women? 
Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Um, so one of the biggest risk factors for back pain actually is uh, female sex. So it's more common oh. um, in our female uh, in our female population. Interesting. I had I, no. I would have guessed otherwise. I would have thought guys would have had more lower back pain, but interesting. And why I think is guys it? Make, guys may complain about it more, but I think the more the more uh, <laughs> common find good point. Sure is, is in, is in. <laughs> Now, you know, like, how does it differ in age groups when it comes to back pain? You know, I'm assuming different kinds of back pain for different ages, but you know, what, 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 you know, what percentage of guys, older guys get back pain, younger guys, whatever. Yeah. I mean, the most, I would say the most common uh, time frame of big people having back pain is age 40 to 80. Um, mm-hmm. So as people get older, their back progresses, degeneration happens and they get more back pain. Um, so the causes are certainly different between, you know, younger people versus older people. But as we get older, more people certainly do get more, uh, more back pain. But, but we do see back pain in men under 40 though, right? That is, sure. that is, yeah, that for is sure. seen, right? For sure. I mean, the, the people we see under 40, majority of them are your weekend warriors, are your people helping their friend move pulling a muscle, doing some stuff around a house. So those, that's some of the most common things we see is muscular pain or nonspecific sort of back pain in people under 40. And then for the people, I mean, that makes sense, right? Like, I mean, like I, if I go out right now, I'm 34. If I go out and I throw a ball too hard, I feel it in my arms. So definitely if I'm going to like lift something, my back can't handle it. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. I mean, I take the trash out and my back starts hurting, right? So it's like, yeah. <laughs> but um, so you're talking about musculoskeletal mostly in, in younger guys, but what about older guys? You know, that 40 to 80, what are the most common causes for, for back pain? Yeah. That yeah. That's a great question. So most common arthritic pain, so just like we have arth- arthritis in our knees and our joints, we get arthritis in our back too. And so when you have these little joints get arthritic, there's inflammation, it irritates the nerves. And that's probably one of the most common, common um, things that we see. And then we start seeing, you know, the, the layman terms of sort of sciatic pain or disc herniations. Um, those are probably the two most common things that we see as we get older. Um, majority of my patients really are in the 50, 60, 70 year old range. And that's probably the thing that I see 80, 90 percent of the time. Can you can you expand on sciatica? Because look, I yeah, I'm not gonna lie. A lot of the patients I see, it's listed under diagnosis sciatica, and they constantly talk to me during our visit about the sciatica. So, <laughs> could you kind of expand on like, it? Like, you know, like what? Yeah. You know what? I what feel is like it? I just hear old people saying like, "I buy sciatica." Like everyone <laughs> has a sciatica. Yeah, please. Expand. See, it tells you how common it is in in, in elderly population. All right. Um, <laughs> No, that's a good question. So, you know, we have nerves in our, in our back and anytime there's a nerve impingement, well, our, those nerves in our back provide sensation down our lower extremities. So if a nerve is impinged, then you're going to start having sensations going down the legs in that particular nerve to so nerve root distribution. So people, you always maybe hear people say my, my L4-5 and my L5-S1. Well, that's that particular nerve is impinged, and those nerves are the ones that go down to our leg, to our foot, um, with some numbness and tingling sensation that people typically experience. And the sciatica is an arthritic, arthritic thing. It's a herniated disc thing. What is what is really the main yeah, cause of the sciatica? Question. So it can be from it can be from arthritic changes or degeneration that's causing impingement on a nerve. It can be from a disc protrusion that's uh, protruding and touching or impinging a nerve, um, or it can be from stenosis or narrowing of a canal of the, of the spinal canal. When it gets narrow, that can impinge some of the, um, some of the nerves or nerve fibers in there as well. So those are probably the three most areas we see. And so, so how do you treat that? You know, yeah. you, you treating it like by the underlying cause or is there medication for this? Yeah. So, you know, I, I always think of it in like three big buckets. So bucket number one is physical therapy. So typically when someone comes to see me, I, I want them to start physical therapy um, and really give that a good shot for four to six weeks. You know, our okay. next 
big bucket we think about is medications. And we have, you know, four or five different types of medications that we, you know, sort of try based on, you know, how the patient, you know, the patient's history or whatnot. And then the third bucket is interventions or injections or spine injections that we would consider um, based on what imaging shows and based on sort of the patient's uh, symptoms. And what percentage of the time would you say, I mean, maybe it's hard because there's so many different ways in which you can do like that you can get a satis- get that pain satisfactory or at least adequately well controlled or at least improve the pain. Cause I feel like a lot of times it's hard to just completely yeah. eliminate pain and back pain in general. And obviously we'll get more into that as we progress in this, but in general for, for sciatica, how about that? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, it, it's certainly very, very challenging. I think, the, the patients who sort of really use each bucket that I just mentioned, the PT, the medication, and sort of the injections, and try to really attack this upfront with some sort of preventative things, and you can try to get ahead of it and try to something avoid something more invasive. You can try to avoid something more surgical, which obviously we're all trying to trying to trying to um, you know sort of avoid sort of major surgical sort of procedures. Right. Gotcha. So you know. I think it's kind of something that we touched on, but, you know, back pain is very complicated. Um, Several specialties deal with the back, you know, you got neurosurgeons that deal with it. You got anesthesiologists, interventional pain, you know, Justin and I deal with it because, you know, they're like, I got back pain. Is it a kidney stone? You know, there's, you know, I feel like back pain is just kind of everywhere. And so, you know, to your knowledge, is there a reason why all these potential things all lead to back pain specifically? You know, why, why does it all go there? Yeah. So, I mean, if you think about, if you think about our lumbar spine, right, it's, it is essentially the center point of our entire body. So, you know, it's holding up our, our torso, it's supporting our legs, and it's, it's all the force ends up going to our lumbar spine. And so constantly when you're doing activity, whether you're sitting in a chair, or you're, you're walking around, you're running, you're doing groceries, you're putting load and pressure on this lumbar spine. And so everything really does rely around this thing. And so that's where we start talking about preventative things. We start talking about what things that people can do now and later, what they should have done, really to help support that center point of their body or that lumbar spine. Interesting. Yeah. I mean, it makes sense, right? Like, so the, the spine is literally the center of your body. You know, we, it's literally the it's center the of penis. your body. Was, well, that's the maybe penis. your brain <laughs> and your is centered on your penis. Right, right, yes. Right. But your thoughts go to your penis, but your body goes to your back, you I guess. You <laughs> but, you know, I think going back to my other thing that I was like, you know, I have, I throw a ball, I get frozen shoulder. I get a problem with my shoulder. I usually work it off. And, you know, you have those weekend warriors, someone who's like lifting something or exercising for their only the weekend and they have back pain. What's the threshold to really understand like when someone should be going for back pain? Because like, as Kevin said, you know, it's complicated. There's a million reasons why you could have back pain. It may last a day. You may be done, but, how do we know when, when it's something like, oh shit, like I maybe should go see a doctor about this? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, if you start having, we start thinking about, you know, what we say neurological symptoms. So persistent numbness, persistent tingling, you know, you feel like you're subjectively weak um, or it just doesn't go away. Right. You know, we, we know our bodies really, really well. You sort of know, Hey, so this has been nagging me for two or three weeks or four weeks and just not going away. It's not subsiding. It's probably a good time to to see someone to get it checked out to see is it is there something else going on is there a nerve impingement or is there something that needs to sort of get addressed um those are probably the big thing is numbness tingling weakness and really your own self telling you okay this is this is not going away so you know justin and i we did it oh go ahead yeah i just want to follow up on yeah 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 yeah, jump in because i think one thing that we don't think about often that we can see is urinary issues right like if your urinary patterns change if your erections change after a back issue, like an injury or something, these are other things to consider as part of maybe something's not the way it should, because these things can be impacted, you know, you know, testicular pain, stuff like that. We've seen right. it. So like, these are, these are just other things to talk about. Sorry. Just wanted to bring that up. 
I mean, just uh, to go off that too. I mean, that's for sure big red flags for sure. Yeah, you know, urinary. That actually probably will bring the guy in. <laughs> <laughs> At that point, like, we got to do something much sooner than that. Yeah, for sure, for sure. So you know, Justin and I, we we did an episode a couple of while ago with Doctor uh, John and Brombot, basically on you know getting a guy to see a doctor. Now on this note, guys got back pain, you got the numbness, tingling, maybe you've developed the ED, but um, you know what is the best? You know what doctor should this guy go see for this initial evaluation of back pain? Yeah, you know I think when there's no when there's really no workup done yet, I mean, you know it's either you start off with your primary doctor. Or you see a non-surgical um, spine specialist. You know, for me, you know, we I, I'm in a spine center where we work with spine surgeons and non um, and non-specialists like myself. And so, one of the things that I try to do is I try to exhaust all conservative therapy, work the patient up with appropriate imaging, X-rays, MRIs, and, and, and whatnot um, to really see is there something surgical or not. Um, so I would probably say sort of non-surgical spine physician is probably the, the, the best place to, to, to start off with. Interesting. That's cool. I, I really didn't know. This. So like you, you can be considered like a first line person for back pain for sure. Cause I usually, I always assumed it would be like a primary care only, and then it would be a referral thing, but that's really good to know. Like, and that makes sense too, because you know, you don't necessarily need to go to your primary care to see a urologist. You should, so it's the same thing. Is that right? Yeah. 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 Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Certainly, you know, most patients have a very good relationship with the primary, you know, with their PCP. And so they're probably easier to get into. They're probably easier to have a, 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 a very easy to access them through my chart, a sort of patient physician messaging. Um, and it, and it may depend on the in, insurance too, right? Insurance may need yeah. a referral yeah. as well yeah, and exactly. all that stuff. So yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, so, you know, what is a typical pain workup? You mentioned you were kind of alluding to it, like x-ray stuff like that. What is a typical pain workup include? Like when you see your doctor, like you, I'm coming in for initial back assessment because my back's been hurting me for three weeks. Like, what are you going to do to assess my, my pain? Yeah. I mean, first, so first thing I think is, is super important is actually doing a a real history and physical exam. Like I really got I need to understand sort of what are their symptoms. Um, and then I'll probably send someone to physical therapy if they haven't done that yet. And so one of the challenging things that I found with physical therapy is, especially in sort of age groups 30 to 50, these people are typically active, they, they, they exercise. Um, and you ask them to go to physical therapy, those exercises actually seem very elementary. And so I actually preface that with patients that, hey, these exercises are pretty elementary, but they're going to work out. They're going to do certain muscles that are weak, that are sort of causing you to have this back pain. So, you know, really give it a good, good shot and a good chance. So that's probably the first thing I'll do is history, really good history, good physical, and then probably start them with um, physical therapy. And so if this pain is persistent, you know, typically after six weeks, then it's an appropriate time to get sort of an, an MRI. Right. And so why do I want an MRI? An MRI is really helpful for nerves and soft, soft tissue and sort of the spinal cord, the spinal canal to tell me sort of what's, you know, what's happening and sort of correlate that with sort of the, you know, the patient's symptoms. All right. Well, that's, that that's good to know. I mean, I find that physical therapy is being used a lot more often, at least I'm using it a lot more often, oh, yeah. just even with like pelvic oh, yeah. floor stuff. So you know, it's good. Sometimes it's kind of addressing some of the more basic stuff, as you said, the basic exercises that we kind of, I think, take for granted, but they actually do a lot for your sure. body. Um, mm -hmm. So let's say you got back pain. It's musculoskeletal, but look, I'm like, I, I don't need to go, go to the doctor for this. What, what do you usually recommend guys do to kind of help that pain? Yeah, I mean, that's a great question. And you know, I started thinking about myself, too. Like, what should I do? To prevent myself when I'm like, dude, you definitely <laughs> don't listen to your own recommendations. <laughs> <laughs> I already know, dude. Yeah. Right? You're like, what, what do I need to do? No, you're right. You're right. You're right. You're right. Dude, the, I, I would say the most important thing really is um, core exercises. I mean, and when we think about core exercise, really, what is your core, right? So, a core is really your your back muscles, your glutes, your quads, hamstrings, hips, and abs. That, that group of muscles, if you think about it, those are the ones that are surrounding that, that lumbar spine. So going back to what I mentioned earlier, it's a center point of our body. 
if you get the muscles around that spine as strong as possible, essentially your spine just gets to like float there. And so you make your muscles work for you. And so that's where core, core exercises is, is so, so important. So you're saying skipping leg day is actually bad. <laughs> it is bad. Yes. Yes. Uh, it's duly noted. <laughs> I got to start. Now, <laughs> well, I mean, I, this is just a natural follow-up to that, you know, when we're talking, cause you're talking about exercise, preventative care. Um, obviously like what about people who have back issues? Like, is there a better way to run? Is there biking? Is it like, are there better ways to do these things to relieve your back pain? Like if someone's like, you know, we see people, they're runners, they love to run, but like maybe there's, how can they reduce that lower back pain? Or like someone like a biker, positional issues, like what recommendations yeah. do you have for these people? Yeah, I mean, that's a common question I get is, hey, you know, can I just run instead or can I just cycle instead? And my, my response to that, if it is causing worsening back pain when you are running or cycling, then take a break and focus on core and really try to get that core, that core lumbar spine muscles, glutes and whatnot stronger. So when you do go back to start running, you know, your, your, your spine can handle that because those muscles will, will start working for you. So if you're having that, take a break and, and really focus on that core and try to get that stronger in the next couple of weeks. But what about like, is it like better on your back if you're, you know, like the dumb shoes or like the foot shoes or like the grass, like running on grass as opposed to con turf, uh, to concrete or like well, running well, the on whole treadmill. turf grass a thing. I think some of those NFL players would like to have a word with you on that. <laughs> right. <dude. laughs> exactly. Exactly. That's more knees. We'll get to that. Oh, that's true. That's more knees. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, certainly when you're, when you're running on cement and you're running on sort of concrete, you're, you're not only putting excess load or that force onto your knees, you're also putting those, that force onto those small joints we have in our back as well. So it's just constant, constant force. And so Obviously, you don't, you want to do everything you can to take pressure off that spine um, and excess force off that spine. So running on grass certainly would be um, advantageous, or, or a treadmill that has good sort of uh, what are those? Yeah, those like a force pads, right. like more a bounce, pad or more bounce, less. Yeah, resistance. a little more bounce. This certainly will help again put less force on that on that spine. All right. So it seems like the goal was to you know at least from the preventative side is to kind of take the load off the, the, the lumbar spine. And, you know, that's kind of helped with kind of core exercises and such, but let's, let's kind of dial back now to the patient who is now, you know, pretty deep in, they've had the workup and they they're seeing you, you're an interventional pain doctor. So what, what are you like, what treatments are you now offering these patients who have, you know, these back issues? <clears throat> yeah. So, you know, I, 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 I do a, a several different sort of spine injections. But a lot of my spine injection that I do, I try to make it very specific and localized. So that's where it goes back to, I need to know the, the patient's symptoms. I need to correlate that with what the MRI shows. And then, you know, some of the common sort of uh, lay sort of injections that we think about is epidural injections, right? Those are injections that we do in our back where we inject a steroid. And the, the goal is to, you know, decrease pain for sort of a short amount of time. You know, I think we all recognize that these steroid injections or spine injections they don't last forever, right? And so these spine injections that we do, we're trying to get you a, a uh, two or three or four months of relief or an, some, some time from relief. So then you are able to get back and be more functional and, and do more sort of therapy and exercise. So then when that medication wears off, you've already already sort of made it through, through that hump. So that's the purpose of these sort of spine injections that we do. And so we try to localize it to sort of where a particular nerve is impinged or where a particular joint is inflamed. We try to target it to try to access exactly where that pain is again, to get some, to be more functional again. Now, is this something that's forever or is it like you do it six times and then it's improved or, you know, or is it kind of just depend? Like, obviously you're trying to improve their functionality so that they can get to a point where maybe they are able to sustain, you know, some kind of better control by doing exercises or whatever. But, you know, what percentage of the time are people able to get off of this intervention versus, you know, this being a more permanent matter? You know, like I think about it in terms of like testosterone therapy. You know, we need to treat guys with testosterone therapy when they have low testosterone. That's it. You know, we tell them you should be, expect to be on this forever. Right. Some guys don't like hearing that, but some, but that's sometimes the reality of the situation. How does that relate? Yeah. You know, to yeah, for sure. Doing? I mean, that's a, that's a great question. So I, I get that 
ask frequently is how often can I have these serum injections or how often should I do them, right? And so I usually would tell them three, three times in a 12 month period, I'm okay doing an epidural injection. Um, my mantra always, and I tell my patients this is let less is more, right? So least amount of injections I can do will help you. Least amount of invasive surgeries you can have will help you. And so again, we want to limit it. We want to try to get them as functional as they can with the least amount of sort of injection interventions that we, um, you know, that I can offer. But in, in yeah. your experience though, do you see that you tend to kind of have to stay on these injections for a long time or no? You know, not necessarily. You know, I think the, the patients that take advantage of the pain of the pain relief and start doing exercise and therapy, yeah. those are the ones that actually do really well. And they can sort of stop interventions, get off some medications, um, and sort of just sustain or sort of manage um, manage their pain. Um, and certainly, I have some patients that I you know I do injections on every three, four, or five months, and it's it helps them and. I tell them the same thing. As long as it helps you and you're functional, it's safe and reasonable and sort of reasonable to do. Now, when we're going, you you obviously, the goal you said is like strength conditioning, all this stuff to get off of this and improve yourself. But what about other lifestyle things? I mean, there's no question about it that things like being overweight has to do some back, yeah. cause back issues. Things like, I think smoking cigarettes potentially can have an impact. Can you just like, kind of go through these kinds of lifestyle, like lifestyle issues, how they impact your back and then, you know, how improve, how either cutting them down or fixing them can, can relieve those problems. Yeah. I mean, you, you hit, you hit on the two most important parts when it comes to the spine, right? And so the spine is, is such a complicated sort of thing, right? There's muscles, there's nerves, there's joints all in the spine. And so there's only two things that we know sort of in, when we talk about the spine that we know for certainty, that I would say for certainty. Number one is maintain a healthy body weight, right? So if you maintain a healthy body weight, what are you doing? You're taking load and pressure off that spine. And then number two, don't smoke. Because smoking, it, it's, you know, I'm sure, you know, all providers and all physicians have their own reasons why someone shouldn't smoke. For me, when it comes to the spine, you think about, you know, how, how do we get oxygen, oxygen to the rest of our bodies? Through our blood vessels. Well, there's not a lot of oxygen delivery to our spine. And so when you smoke, you're causing a lot of sort of constriction of those vessels and not really getting oxygen to your spine. And what does that do? Well, it starts progressing the degeneration of your spine. It starts causing more arthritic changes. It starts giving you more age-related changes. And so you don't want to be 40 and you have a 60-year-old spine. And so that's where smoking really comes into play when you think about spine. So number one, maintain healthy body weight and don't smoke. And that was probably the two um, <clears throat> preventative things that you could probably do that we sort of know for, for certainty. You know, interestingly, I have several patients that are probably 80 and, and 90 and, and, and they're, they're great. They're functional. They're, you know, exercising regularly. And I make it a point when I see these patients as a new patient to ask them, I'm like, Hey, so like, you know, what, what did you do growing up? Like you're 90 years old and you're, walking around like you're 60 yeah. and consistently without a doubt, they're telling me, I asked them, did you smoke growing up? No, they never smoked. And they're 90 and they're fit. So they've, they've always maintained a healthy body weight. And I found that consistent, consistently. And this is obviously anecdotal experience, but um, it's, it's uh, reassuring and nice to see that, you know, it's, it's, if you do these things, you know, you do have, at least you're setting yourself up the right way, I, I would think. And also helps out with all the other stuff by maintaining a healthy weight and, you know, not smoking. Exactly. Directions right? are yeah, better. Yeah, but it's just so interesting because I don't know about you, Kevin. I never would have associated smoking with back, no. back pain. That would actually be the last thing I'd probably associate <laughs> with. Yeah, I mean, like, you just it's just amazing how many things smoking fucks up on your body, man. Yeah. I mean, yeah. we, we've gone through Everything. so many, you know, cancer. Now we got back pain. We got infertility. We got erectile dysfunction. Like, you know, it's, you know, there's it's no amazing. One, <laughs> yeah, there's just literally no positives. But the one question I have, because when I'm thinking about cigarette smoking and you're telling people to quit, like, you know, obviously it impacts heart disease, lung cancer, breathing. Is there some impact of quitting and reversibility? Like, I, I think we want to mm, motivate people question. to be stopping that's smoking. Or is there a point of no return for your back? Because it's kind of a harder thing to monitor 
with, you know, how smoking yeah. is impacting these little vessels. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So, you know, what you're trying to do is you're trying to slow the progression of the of the spine, slow the progression of the disease. We we all, regardless, are gonna get degeneration of our spine. You know, I get an MRI of you and Kevin and, and me, we all get MRIs, so we're all gonna have degeneration and disc disease and disc protrusion. It's a normal finding. What we're trying to do is we're trying to we're trying to slow the progression of that. We're trying to slow the progression of the arthritic changes. And so if you do stop smoking, um, you're just slowing that down. You're just slowing that down. So it's still a benefit. You hear it, guys? It's never too late. The point was I was trying to make is it's never too late to quit smoking. Not not the other point, like you're fucked. Like, oh no. This, <laughs> yeah, <yes. laughs> um, Sorry. Well, okay, right, on, on, on the note, all right. So, you know, smoking bad, you know, healthy weight, good. Now, how about massages? You know, I drive by sometimes, my back's kind of hurt, and I see the, the, the neon sign for massages. you think the, uh, <laughs> these massages will help improve the back pain? It won't hurt. How about that? Okay. It, won't, it won't hurt. You know, it, it's, you know, what do the massages do, right? They really do, uh, you know, relax your muscles, stimulate your muscles, keep them loose, keep them active. Um, so it certainly won't hurt. Is it going to change your sort of your arthritic changes or your disc degeneration or your disc protrusion? You know, probably not. But certainly, you know, by having relaxed and fit and loose muscles, it can at least sort of help, um, you know, relax those. Tom Brady sense. gets, I think, massages all the time. I mean, that's how he keeps I think most, most of these athletes do. Like, I think they, they have do. personal yeah. masseuses that get, like, massages, like, every day, which... Yeah, it's awesome. I think Deshaun Watson gets a lot of massages too. <laughs> allegedly, 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 I guess. allegedly. I don't know. Alleg sorry. allegedly. Yeah. <laughs> but even even off that, Kevin, if you think about if you think about and going back again to taking load off that spine. Well, if your muscles are taut or they're tight and they're spastic, and well, they can only do so much, right? They can't contract as much, and so. The load's going to go somewhere. It's going to go onto those spine joints. So if you keep those muscles loose, you allow them to contract, you allow them to sort of be functional the way they're supposed to be, that's where massages really come into play. And they really say, let's keep these muscles loose active, which goes, you know, goes on to what you're saying, Justin, about athletes getting massages all the time. Is what are they trying? They're trying to keep those muscles contracting all the time and, and loose. And so certainly it's beneficial because you want to keep those, those muscles sort of going. Sorry, there's a huge, there's a load joke in Deshaun Watson in my head. I'm not going to go there. But I could, I just, I can't undo that thought. Like, load Deshaun. It was just too much. <laughs> but uh, I'm going to, I'm going to pivot for a second. And our conversation with the arthritis and like a lot of things that we talk about for men's health when we're talking about testosterone, like is osteopenia, osteoporosis, mm -hmm. you know, how important is good hormone levels in back pain? Mm -hmm. uh, you question. know, like, obviously that's something we talk about as urologists, we manage testosterone because, you know, that is one of the reasons to put people on <clears throat> testosterone to improve their bone density, especially when they're older. How important is that for back pain as well? Yeah. Huge, 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 huge. I mean, I treat patients who get um, osteoporotic compression fractures of their spine. And so um, these patients have weak bones and they're typically you know, 50, 60, 70 year old patients and their bone have typically osteopenia osteoporosis and they get these compression fractures and it's a significant amount of pain. They need to go through an invasive procedure, typically need to go through an invasive procedure to help stabilize that and, and reduce their pain. And so what I typically do afterwards, after we you know, do this procedure intervention, is I do send them for osteoporotic management, whether through an endocrinologist or through their primary doctor, um, because that bone quality is, is so, so important. It's so interesting, right, Kim? Because like, I feel like that's one aspect of testosterone and hypogonadism or low testosterone that kind of gets lost in the mix. We always talk about sexual desire, energy, libido, but clearly there's a, a big connection here. And that's really one of the big things that in our guidelines it actually mentions, right? Yeah, you're absolutely right. I actually feel like when I do counsel my patients on, you know, the benefits of testosterone replacement, that's kind of one I actually kind of gloss over. And now I kind of feel like I should kind of expand on that, you know, and, you know, how important that is in terms of, you know, bone health. 
right? You know, right. And and it goes even beyond that, right? Because obviously for the bone health, but if the guys with low testosterone don't have the energy or the muscle mass, their core is uh, weaker. Right. Their core is weaker. They can't the do the exercise. They're really, it's a multifactorial wow. cause of back pain. Wow. Yeah, right. It's just a cycle. Right. It's just a cycle, you wow, know? Wow, just... look at that. Maybe we should do a study of back pain and testosterone levels. Yeah, yeah seriously. Imagine Honestly, think how connected all, all this really is. It's very interesting. I mean, the more we've done this podcast, it's pretty crazy how you can really connect every part of the body and it sounds dumb but it's like well it's literally all connected it's literally all connected why would they not interact in some bigger picture way but a spot especially the spine right it's literally you said it it's the central part of your body it is an essential part right. so there's no reason that it shouldn't be impacted by literally any other potential bad thing mm -hmm. that's going on with your body you know yeah absolutely Absolutely. Um, I don't know. Any, any other uh, thoughts or comments, Kev, from your end? Uh, no, I mean, I learned a lot about, you know, things I need to do to kind of prevent lower back pain. But uh, Dr. Shaw, any final thoughts or comments for our listeners? Anything about lower back pain? Uh, yeah, absolutely. No, I think, you know, back pain certainly is one of the most debilitating sort of injuries I think I think that we can have it sort of limits us um, and we've all experienced it right and think about the last three months have you had back pain sure we've all had, we've all had it you know I personally think it's super important to be proactive with your with your health um, proactive with your spine really think about prevention and that's really staying active exercising you know, maintain healthy body weight and really just eat well um, and uh, there's really no best time to start other than today so I think it's super important. I have one final question that I was just thinking about because like we were mm -hmm. talking about, you just brought it up, you know, in the last three months, we've all had back pain. If you have that regular back pain or there's like a one-off thing, you're that weekend warrior, icing your back, heating your back, uh, mm. and like Advil, Tylenol, is there a best option mm. and best way to approach that general standard back pain from, you know, just maybe pushing yourself a little too hard. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Think about from a medication perspective, sort of the over the counters, you're really just trying to decrease inflammation. So what good good inflammation medications we have are anti-inflammatories. So the Aleve, the ibuprofens or whatnot. Um, and then when you're thinking about icing versus heating, you know, which one really helps? It, it's heating certainly will help um, when you are trying to sort of start an activity or just trying to you know, get going for what you're trying to do is trying to get those muscles sort of warm. When you're doing some sort of cool down and things like that. That's where sort of icing sort of will, will come into play and, and be really helpful. Oh, interesting. Cool. So heat, heat at the beginning and then ice at the end, basically. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. That's great. All right, man. Well, thank you, Dr. Shaw. So Dr. Shaw, before we close up here and wrap it up, where can our listeners find you? Tell us a little bit about your practice, you know, mm -hmm. if you're on socials or whatever. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So I'm a um, practicing um, interventional pain specialist in Houston for uh, Baylor College of Medicine. We're part of a spine center. Um, uh, my Twitter handle is Krishna Bisha MD. Um, and yeah, happy to help and see anyone and, and take care of you guys. Awesome. Well, this was really great. I want to thank you again, Dr. Shah, for, for coming on and talking with us. Um, really cool way to, you know, talk about a topic that is very, very common. I think people just don't talk about enough and cool to see, at least from my perspective, I'm sure Kevin too, how it really relates to a lot of other men's health issues yeah. um, that, that we really talk about all the time. Um, as always, guys, you can feel free to listen to us on any podcasting platform, Spotify, iTunes, download, subscribe, give us a review, five stars. You can find us on any social media platform, that's YouTube. Definitely download, definitely subscribe there. You got TikTok, Instagram, Twitter, at the Man Up Pod. It's all the same across. Kev, where can they find us? What's our website? You can find us at www.themanuppod.com. And that's it for, for me, Dr. Sean, Kevin. Thanks for listening. Until next time, have a good one, guys.